Thera Prudence is speaking today. It's a celebration of life event for a great guy, Phil Haney, just a superhuman being and uh, someone that, that, you know, came to Rochester, Minnesota a lot. And Farrah has been here a lot too. And we're just so pleased to, uh, to uh, be hosting you again next month and looking forward to that. Farrah, you had the opportunity of meeting Phil Haney and spending a lot of time with this gentleman. And uh, would you want to uh, help celebrate his life a little bit today by sharing some of your stories and your thoughts on this great man? Absolutely. I would love that. <laughs> sure. We smile because we're happy we knew him and we're happy for him. We're happy for him. It's our loss. <laughs> so it's his gain. <clears throat> it's his gain. And quite honestly, Wes, uh, I was thinking about it for this past week, and I've just been smiling, and I'm like, thank goodness. Uh, he's not here to see the insanity that is going on in this country right now, um, because I know that he would be just mortified at has how quickly uh, people are just kind of giving up their liberties on a plate uh, in order to be safe from this um, pandemic that we have going on. So... Mm-hmm. Um, I know he's kind of looking down on us and laughing and being like, ha ha. <laughs> he would have a few jokes about this. Yeah. He have a few jokes. He would might even say, let's uh, lock ourselves in and have flagons of ale. Let there be flagons of ale, friend, amigo. And amigo, right? He, he would have found a funny turn, something funny to say about all of this. Yes, he would have. But, you know, one thing that he wouldn't be doing is staying at home and, uh, ducking under the covers well that's a, that's an ironic thing you bring up too because it's really it's really this event that started this whole online this necessity of adopting adapting and improving our means of communication and reaching people so that um if it hadn't been for this pandemic that we're going through and the lockdown i by the way am an essential worker so i'm just letting everybody know that these <laughs> but uh I have papers I have to carry in my vehicle, yeah, which must right. be in my vehicle at all times. But uh, nobody's asked to see them yet, but uh, we were given papers. So when we're going to work, if we're stopped, we can explain our uh, presence on the street. But uh, this this thing sort of led to the necessity of getting online and, and having chats like this. And then, you know what? Hundreds of people can view this online. People know you here in Rochester and they, they remember your presentations and you really moved rooms full of people. You, you moved people in a way no one had really done up to that point in time, except for uh, Mr. Haney himself, because the way that his delivery style was similar to yours is that there was an there was an understatement. Of, this is just the way things are. There was no hysterics involved. I want to mention before we get too much further that Farah Prudence, her mission is free the captive, and free the captive is dedicated to sharing the hope of the gospel with everyone in order to free them from their chains. We bring the good news of Christ to all who are willing to listen, so that they may lavish in the love of the Lord. I like that alliteration. Our ministry focuses. Her ministry focuses on breaking the bond that false teachings bring to Muslims. Through her work, she educates the public on the violent oppression that women and girls are subjected to under Sharia. And uh, you can reach her uh, at freethecaptive.org. That's freethecaptive.org. It's all one word. And her uh, business email address, Farah, F-A-R-R-A-H, at freethecaptive.org. If you'd like to set up a uh, event in your community or with your uh, patriot group in your part of Minnesota or indeed now anywhere in the world since we're online yeah. uh, thanks to the coronavirus. And it's something inspiring from your mission is the Isaiah 1, uh, chapter 1, verse 17. Learn to do right, seek justice, defend the oppressed, take up the cause of the fatherless, plead the case of the widow. Powerful stuff there, Farah. Thank you. It's, uh, it's it's one of those Bible verses that because of my personality and because of who I am, a very black and white person, I don't operate in a lot of shades of gray. And I do really well with instructions and being given a plan. So a lot of people tend to 
gravitate towards more of like the love and the mercy and the mushy parts of the Bible, which are great and fantastic. And I love them too. Um, but I gravitate more towards like, tell me exactly what you want me to do <laughs> and uh -huh. I do it. <laughs> but I need instructions. I need a plan. I need a clear path uh, and a cool to head to. So it's, uh, it's really, it's really incredible, but thank you for, thank you for that information. It's, uh, it's actually easier than ever now to do presentations because we don't have any travel costs. We don't have any lodging, nothing. And as you know, when, when we travel, we really stay in, uh, well, we try to stay in very humble, um, places and just mm -hmm. kind of eat whatever is yeah. available mm -hmm. um, but now right. it's easier because i can do it from home and then that cost is not on the ministry it's not on the people that are coming so um with that being said when i started this whole thing started with the ministry is because i made this one video and it went viral before facebook shut it down shut down my entire account actually and wow. it was about muhammad and who he was um and now here we are but the i was talking to phil about it uh, because he and I did a tour together in Michigan, and it was sponsored by the American Decency Association. And this was um, before the elections in 2016, I believe that that was. And uh, no, sorry, 2018, before the, the mid-elections in 2018. And after that whole tour, I was on the phone with him, and I was just, I was just telling him, you know, when I started this whole process out, I didn't realize how angry I was because of all the trauma and the abuse and the hurt that was going on. And and my my solution to everything was just like, kill them all. Doesn't matter. This was this is what it was. I was like, it whatever. It doesn't matter if they nuke the Middle East. That was that was honestly where I was at. And it's understandable for people who don't know Farrah Prudence's background story. It's understandable to have gone through the level of abuse and victimization. And there's a process of hate in terms of recovery from abuse. So um, she's, you know, just like Phil Haney, he would say, be wise as serpents, but harmless as doves. There's no injunction here. There's no message of, of hate in Farrah's uh uh, message whatsoever but you, you for, yeah. for people who haven't heard her stories or lectures you have to know her background uh, she yeah. comes out of a out of, out of bondage frankly it's right. Luke exactly. ministry exactly and to tell people a little bit it was the the I've experienced just a, the rainbow of abuse from sexual abuse to physical verbal mental all of it um Spiritual, and, and still to this point, still to this point, I still have a death threat on me. And the difference is, the difference is between the time I started. So here's the interesting thing. When I put out that video, it was like five days after I got saved. And after I submitted my life to Christ, that was five days. Since then, <laughs> the transformation of not because of me, but what Christ has done in me is I've gone from that point to now my mission is to bring Ishmael home, is to bring Muslims to Christ. I am heartbroken. I'm heartbroken when I see them killing each other. I'm heartbroken when I see them killing other people. I'm heartbroken when I hear about um, like what happened in Mecca with the accidents where a bunch of them died, um, with the storms, sorry. And I'm just thinking I'm like, that's that many souls that will never be saved. That's a loss when you look at the big picture. And it's because of the work that Christ has done in me and on my heart. Um, I can't even imagine going back to that place of anger and hate and rage. But I was talking to Phil about it on the phone and I said, I'm just so, I'm tired. I'm so, all of the hate and the anger that's in the media, uh, whether it's the parties going at each other, the politics, the people going at each other. And I just, I don't wanna do anything with it anymore. I, all I want to do is be with my father, my heavenly father. Mm -hmm. All I want to do is read my Bible. And I really thought he was going to admonish me basically and tell me that I've got a job to do and I need to get up and do it. But he didn't. Phil said, I understand. Mm -hmm. And I want to go back to my first love too. And that's when he told me that when he started his life, he was an evangelist. And I was dumbfounded by this because, you know, your idea of an evangelist, my idea of an evangelist, or, you know, he went door to door, was mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. somebody who's not really involved in politics and not really, 
very worldly. It's just somebody who's really the focus is the Bible. That's the be all and end all. Um, and he really breaks all of the stereotypes and he kind of talked me through it. And I, I stayed doing that. And then he was just talking about how we can serve the country through Christ and how to be able to fight this spiritual, spiritual war on any Avenue that it comes. So, um, yeah. I have nothing but love for that man. And, and there you were seeing him in action, doing that Johnny Appleseed tour through Michigan. And then and then he was doing that in Minnesota as well, as you've done. He, he taught through his example of, uh, look, here's the facts. Here's the original source material. Here's the data. If I'm quoting from the Quran, don't call me a hater. Don't call me a, an Islamophobe. I'm just giving you quotes. I'm not giving hate speech here. If, yeah. if you don't like what they're saying, take it up with them. But also he'd come around with the original source material, like the explanatory memorandum on the general goals of taking right. over, you know, through the groups that are in place. And and his book, of course, See Something, Say Nothing, was all about blowing the whistle on what's going on. And he would he would come to communities and he could win people over with that calm demeanor. There was nothing angry. There wasn't any hate or animus in him at all. There wasn't a, a bone of racism at all in him, and he would he would win people over, even skeptics, with just oh, that. Phil really uh, embodied the that we got in, I believe it's First Corinthians, where Paul talks about your best to live at peace with everybody, and he was able to juggle this. You know this, Wes, to juggle this, telling the truth and giving facts while being at peace with everybody. Mm -hmm. And Phil was, he's awesome. He's totally able to go up. He could go up to a Muslim, tell him all of the facts, remain mm -hmm. calm, be under attack, be called names, be yelled at, do whatever it is, and it wouldn't shake him, and it wouldn't faint him, and he would have nothing but love for that person ahead of him. We, I had had so many talks with him uh, he was really excited about the ministry that we have, Free the Captive. And the mission that we put out, Arm Your Shepherd, um, totally bounced that off of him. <laughs> I bounced everything off of Phil, okay? <laughs> so everything I bounced, I bounced off of Phil. Um, I also bounced the idea of Exodus, which is the project that we're still working on. And I can't tell you, I mean, I pitched the idea of Exodus, Exodus to him. I told him how big it is. And he said, God is bigger. And he went on for like 20 minutes, so excited, talking about getting American Muslims out of the chains of Islam that keeps them bound, even when they're American citizens, and bring them into the light of freedom. And you could just hear that excitement, that smirk on his face. He was just, you, he couldn't love them more. There's no way this man or anybody could love Muslims or anybody else more because he truly had um, a connection to heaven. He truly had God's heart for people. I, something you said reminds me of how he would be tolerant of us in our ignorance. You know, he, he would teach us some new data point about uh, the brotherhood and he would say, well, this is what's going on. And he would present the slides and present the, the papers and the, and the material. And uh, someone would ask sort of, uh, it would be like being in a rocket telemetry class and someone asks about the number line, which number comes after five and the, he's teaching calculus, but he never was frustrated. He wouldn't send anybody out of the room. He was a teacher who could reach people where they were at and bring them up to speed really quickly. And Farah, you mentioned something, the Arm Your Shepherd mission. This is a new effort that uh, Farah just mentioned she was discussing with Phil Haney. It's a mission that she's been building since 2019. It's a starter kit that's a collection of reference books yes. that will help Christian clergy to get the facts and learn about Islam from scholars and those who have experience of Islam firsthand, this kit was put together, especially for the clergy, but it's a must have in every American home and it's available to the general public. And that's so important. It's part of what Phil Haney's purpose was and his mission was as well to help reach the pastors about the misinformation that they've been given 
Um, even I've met some politicians and religious people who think that Islam predates Christianity. And so they, their basic timeline of historical fact of, you know, the <laughs> just the num just the timeline is is a is a shambles and a mess. But uh, dealing with that ignorance was something Philip Haney was very patient with. But I was on the phone with a with a politician and uh, they insisted that uh, Christianity had come after Islam. And so I had to give a basic historical primer of the of the centuries, you know, using the Gregorian. Uh, calendar <laughs> numbering system because uh, I well, still don't understand yeah, why it's... there's any confusion about that at all. But misinformation is not when we talk about uh, freeing people from the chains of lies and misinformation, it's not just Muslims, it's also non Muslims who have been fed this and gobbled it up. And it's laughable to me to a certain extent, it's extremely frustrating because I grew up in the Middle East and I mean, world history was taught to us in like fourth grade. OK, we knew what the timeline was um, and I'm sad. I'm really sad to say this, but most fifth, sixth graders in the Middle East know more about world history than many of the people here in the States. And that's something that we are going to have to change. I literally I had somebody who a couple of weeks ago and I try I try to be like Phil. Right. There's a really big standard. But um, a couple of weeks ago, who came up to me and said, well, you know that the Catholic Church started Islam. I was like, oh, <laughs> oh my gosh, man. Oh my gosh. Yeah, 2,000 years ago. I was like, first yeah. of all, the church has only been around for like 2,000 years. One. Two, at the time that Islam started, there was no such thing as the Catholic Church. The whole church was the Catholic Church. The schism hasn't happened yet. Yeah. No. The East had moved away from Rome, and the Protestants weren't even a thought on anybody's mind. <laughs> Martin Luther wasn't even born. When Islam started, Islam started 600 years after the death of Christ or 634 or something like that. So um, it's really important for us to to know what the history is. But Phil was incredibly, incredibly patient. And one of the things that I absolutely loved about him, because I've gone on tour with other speakers and um, I've seen I've gone to different um I've gone to different events and seen other speakers from all kinds of, you know, uh, political backgrounds and whatnot. Usually people do the event and bolt. They're gone. Phil, I was so surprised because I was there after the event and I stay until every last person's questions have been answered or if they want to talk to me, whatever it is, it's done. I mean, I mean, you remember. I remember. Yeah. The, <laughs> the chairs would be all back in the closets. We we would have to clean things up and put the tables away. But that was just fine because there were still people that wanted to linger with you or yes. linger with Phil. And there and they were, you know, he would wait until the cows were ready to go home. He yes. was not gonna kick people out of the room. It was like you know, yeah, Phil answered well. everybody's question and he he treated everybody an equal level. He spoke to human beings with such, yeah. excuse me, yeah. with such dignity, no matter how asinine the question was. <laughs> and I could hear people ask a question. I'm like, were you not paying attention to what he's saying? <laughs> and, uh, he would speak to them with, with dignity and respect. Yeah, yeah. And truly when, um, I'm sorry. When people, when God tells us, when people pray and say, God, please give me your eyes for these people. Please give me your heart for these people. He treated everybody like they were an image of God. And that was incredible to see this man who's tired, um, really tired. Tours are not easy to do. They are exhausting. There's so much driving. There's so much work that goes into the presentation emotionally it's difficult and he's exhausted and you know he's he's not old but he's up there in the years and he's yeah. still patient loving kind and that is something that i aspire to be and i think we should all aspire to be okay i'm done i'm not gonna cry again <laughs> no it's good to it's good to cry 
there were those moments uh, of unbelief after the word came that he was dead, but he he was a big boy and he knew what he was doing and he knew what he was involved with. So he had all the realities of the situation uh, in mind. What you're saying uh, reminds me of something he said that really, well, it's absolutely true, but he, he said it in a really interesting way. He said that for the Muslim mind, time is collapsed. That is, they remember, like you were saying about historicity and the, the acknowledgement of the timeline of events, they feel the collapse of the Ottoman Empire as if it was yesterday. It's still visceral in the people. So time has collapsed. Whereas for Americans, uh, clearly Americans don't remember what happened last week, you know, what, yeah, let alone last month between you know, Trump, Pelosi, all of these names and all these dates. Right. Americans lose track of where the Wuhan flu came from. Why are we all hunkered down? Gee, uh, you know, and then the lies get going and uh, people forget where the Wu flu came from. But for, for, uh, for in the Islamic world, from Morocco to Malaysia, streets are named after famous persons in Islamic history. And streets are named after dates of battles or wars that were fought you know right. the mosques themselves are named after uh we have the abu Bakr al-sadiq which is named after one of muhammad's generals right and yeah. companions of the prophet so uh phil haney would would try to educate us and tell us the meanings of this and that it's i was just sort of covering for you while you recovered from your <laughs> from your cry yeah, it's good to have a good cry though isn't it yeah yeah, it is the guy. Is we'll pick up the phone and get him to call. <laughs> I think about Phil and I, I just laugh hysterically. And sometimes the waves of sadness just, sure. just come. But the reason that is with the collapse of time that you're talking about, I think one of the reasons is, if not the main reason, is when I was as a Muslim child, when I was a Muslim child, I was taught that my significance and my purpose is for the Islamic goal, okay? That's my whole life. This is why my life matters. That's the only reason I matter. There is no individualism. There is no pursue your dream. Everything that you pursue has to be for what? For the goal um, of fulfilling Allah's will and Muhammad's will. And what was Allah and Muhammad's will? It was that everybody on earth would submit to Islam. Okay, mm -hmm. so to them, it's important to know where they've been in order to know where they're going. We as a nation, unfortunately, don't have a goal. Right, right. We don't have a purpose. Um, Muslims don't mind, just like communists, for example. They don't mind working their entire life for this purpose, for this goal, and not seeing any of the fruit, but knowing that their work will help the next generations. Okay. Because what you said about Americans is so true, if I may. Um, yeah. the unlimited acquisition of material wealth and material well-being, the constant concern with uh, in America, where where is your sustenance going to come from? And and acquiring more stuff, and he who ends with the most toys wins, right? And um, that is not a sufficient narrative to sustain uh, a, you know, a civilization or a culture. There has to be a deeper uh, software that's driving the culture and driving the society. And people sense the emptiness now that our economy's in this reset mode and everyone's told, oh, stay home. In fact, we're gonna pay you. We're gonna send you a check. <laughs> Just don't, you know, don't go out, but uh, everybody stay home. Uh, it's, a, it's a strange place to have the economy, the button just reset. But but exactly. Islam does have, I mean, to get back to what you're saying, Islam does have this driving and sustaining narrative that, that pushes it, and particularly women, right, under Islam who are fields to be plowed, right? I mean, yeah. literally, they're just vehicles for, um, you know, sustaining the Islamic yes. population. Yeah. Yeah, for sustaining them. back to the injunction that you borrow from the Old Testament, from Isaiah, the injunction to do good and to free the captive. Right. That's a that's a in the example of Jesus and his treatment of women, even 2000 years ago. There you have a guy and it's codified in, in religious text, his interaction with this woman at the well. 
or with the prostitute who was found in the act of adultery, right? I mean, never mind. Where's the guy, by the way? They didn't bring the guy in, or maybe it was another woman. I don't know. But whatever it was, they just brought this woman to him, and they, they want to stone her, right? Yeah. And, they, and he says, well, let he who's without sin cast the first stone. There's the example of Jesus versus the example of Muhammad. And you've got a clear, you know, you can't have any Chrislam in between. And Phil Haney spoke against Chrislam constantly. So. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And he, he and I um, were actually talking about a conference that is still in the works. I will still put this on if it's the last thing I do. Um, what did he say? He said, um, boil those potatoes for a while or something. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he was just asking me to think on it and to pray on it and to get it going. We were talking about it. But we really wanted to do something to... Uh, really stand up to the interfaith dialogue because we both, I mean, Phil has kind of watched me in my journey of being Christian and, um, and becoming more Christ-like. And uh, it's really, it really bothered us, the interfaith movement. It really went against everything that we believed in and, it, and it's completely against the truth also. So it's, uh, it's something that we wanted to do, but just to touch back on something that you said, and then we'll move on is, there is an emptiness. You worded it perfectly. That emptiness of getting more stuff. Why do we have such high suicide rates? Mm. Why do we have such a high number of divorces? It's because of the emptiness. Because as families, as a nation, for the most part, we don't have a common goal. We mm. don't have. Have you noticed that since this whole COVID thing started, nobody's offended at nurses and doctors singing Amazing Grace? <laughs> is offended at people praying nobody is bringing up the fact that um they are uh being discriminated against when it's yeah. a man who is um has gender dys dysphoria and hey. trying to that he's a woman and trying to use somebody else's bathroom it's almost oh, like yeah. all tied up Notice that it's only men and women who are dying of the coronavirus the other the other 168 genders just aren't there yet at all okay. Um, so, so here's the thing. It's I will take Phil's approach. We have to be sympathetic. We have to have a heart for people. We have to acknowledge that uh, something that Lisa Brevere said that I absolutely love. People's sin is not for our entertainment. Oh. It's not a freaking joke. Lisa, who said that? Brevere. I hope Lisa I'm saying that right. Yes. Oh. <laughs> she, uh, she wrote several books. The one that I listened to is called um, Girls with Swords. It's a pretty good book. Um, but I, I love her. She she just really speaks the truth. And um, it's all signs of being broken. It's all signs of brokenness. And our fabric of our society is broken. And it's broken because, honestly, we don't have Christ. We don't have Christ. If you were to look at the things Phil said about um, interfaith dialogue and, and just basically, um, well, we know that it's not truly a dialogue. There, they're misusing a word. It's just, it's a monologue. Right. They talk and the audience is expected to listen or ask a polite question that they can then lecture on. So there's no dialogue. There's no interlocutor and there's no thesis, antithesis, and then synthesis. There's there's no coming together of the faiths. And if if Christians would be able to be invited to sit on the stage with these interfaith dialogue experts that we have and and present the actual case for what Christianity is versus Islam, no one would be confused about Chrislam. But there's no dialogue. When people and that touches on what you're saying about, you know, people not being driven by this unlimited acquisition of wealth. I mean, it's that people in America are quite coreless and squishy and don't seem to have a core. What empty vessel can be, empty vassal can be filled with anything. And the, the, the people are, we're feeling so hollow at this point that, um, you know, something can come in, which is as pernicious as it is. And it can, it can paint itself in, in a wonderful garb and people buy it hook, line, and sinker because they're into appearances rather than substance. Right. And it's, it's, we have to tackle this with love. We with have love. to do it with love. There, love is the only answer because hate only generates hate. 
And mm. we have to hold everybody with love. We have to see people for who they are. We have to see them through God's eyes. We have to have God's heart for them. And part of that, an essential part of that, that Jesus, Jesus did not mince words. If anybody's ever read the New Testament, they know that Jesus was able to say to somebody, you're a sinner. You are screwing up. You need to fix that. Come to me. Let me help you fix that. Love isn't saying to somebody, oh, wallow in your sin and live it out and it's going to be okay. That's not loving. If I saw my three-year-old happy as a lamb playing with a, pa a pair of scissors, I'm not going to be like, well, you keep doing that as long as you're happy. No, that's not loving. The loving thing to do is to go get the scissors out of her hands, even though it upsets her. So anyways, all right, moving on. Yeah, sure. Moving on. You know, one thing we might mention uh, before we go too much further, because you mentioned about a tour and a conference. Um, Fera Prudence is planning on a, a, we, we had been talking with numerous communities through the Midwest about another tour. And now we're working on technology. And Farah is on April 23rd. Hopefully we're shooting for April 23rd. Um, there's uh, Farah Prudence Free the Captive Mission online. And and I don't know, Farah, have you worked the technology side of that out yet and how you're still in the process? Because phone, the phone is ringing with people who want to know how they can get to your conference we are so this is um this is a tour that i was actually planning with phil for the end of march and um i yeah. hope that he will still be on tour with me and uh he will still he still inspires me to do the work so that's good and it's going to be at the end of april like you said that's going to be the first day of it it's going to be six days and it's great because we're going to be using zoom and I will be able to do the presentation and I will be able to answer people's questions live. Um, and then we have no cost in terms of travel and lodging and everything else. People can absolutely please do donate. The ministry needs every single dime, but please do pray for us above all. And um, it's, it's really cool because I'll be comfortable at home and I'll be sitting down and I'll be talking and chatting to everybody. And you can do small groups, whatever your state allows, groups of 10. One of the things that Phil always said is, I will go and talk to one person. I will go talk to a thousand people. And I have done the exact same thing. I will talk to one person. I will talk to a thousand people. I will talk to whoever is willing to listen. So um, I what what are the, I don't know what the restrictions are right now. In my state, it's a of shelter. It's strict right now. We're still shelter in place and it's going to go on through May. The governor of Minnesota just announced it's being extended through uh, the first week of May or so. I forget the exact date. So people won't be able to gather together in crowds. Uh, we found that we had some trouble helping our elders set up Skype on their computers. So maybe Zoom is definitely Zoom is the better way to go because they just have to click on a link or they can call in with their phone and listen. Yes, but, uh, Zoom those are and your settings. Also putting it through Facebook Live. So right. yeah, Facebook Live, you're not going to be able to talk to me through it because Facebook doesn't allow comments to come through as I'm making the video. Um, but people can email me. People can um, chat through the chat and get their questions through. So if you do have elders that need help with the Zoom or need help with the Facebook Live and and want to ask a question, just have them on the phone and you type in the question for them and then I'll be able to get back to them right there. So that, that's Farah Aziz Prudence uh, touring at the end of April. She's the executive director of Free the Captive and the website is freethecaptive.org, all one word, freethecaptive.org and you can reach her at Farah, F-A-R-R-A-H, at freethecaptive.org. And um, she has a, a tour up and coming. Uh, please be in touch with your community uh, and reach out if you need help setting up technology with your computer or your phone uh, to be able to participate in these things. And as she said, uh, this is a tough time. You know, when someone's touring live and they can, they can actually sell their book and sign it for you and they can uh, sell a DVD. It's different um, online because uh, when it's time to pass the plate and give a hand for the gas money, um, everybody will reach in. You know, if we were to charge money, and there's never nobody's ever been charged money, but when you ask 
for a gift in the plate, they become extremely generous. And uh, so when you're participating online, please remember to uh, put, a, a, you know, put something in the tip jar, so to speak, uh, while you're leaving to help to help pay for expenses because there's still a lot of expenses and time and technology and there's a there's a subscription uh to these things like zoom and people need a hand okay so if you're enjoying the content reach out to farah and she's too modest to give herself that pitch or a plug so to speak so i'll just i just did it for you sorry farah thank you that's okay that wasn't well too embarrassing <laughs> we've also applied to be a 501c3 we just had to pay another $600 to the IRS um, in order to be able to obtain that. So although I work for free, I do not get a dime, not a penny out of this ministry. Um, I work for free. We still have costs associated with the website. We still have costs associated uh, with the work that we do. And this COVID will be over. And when people invite me out to speak, I'd love to say, yes, I can come because I have the money in the account sitting and it will be able to cover my expenses so I can go there and speak. And this is the only way to do it. And if, uh, if you know, a, a, a free will gift is fantastic. We have merchandise on our website that you can purchase. Excellent books. The only books that I share are books that I have read that I think are phenomenal resources for people um, for people to have. So. Some of your artwork is so tremendous too. I, I, so, you know, when I started doing these things with people, they oftentimes wouldn't have artwork and graphics, and you've, you've got that well covered. I think a couple of those should be turned into T-shirts. I hope that doesn't sound too crass, but no. I made some, <laughs> I made some T-shirts out of artwork before. I, I can do that at home, but I'm not very good at it. But yeah, those those kind of things help people have a memory of having met you because it's been it's been really precious when you've been here and a, a lot of people were looking forward to you being here at the end of the month you were you were supposed to be here with phil haney touring minnesota it's astonishing uh that was march 28th you were going to be in rochester right i think it was the end of uh, sorry um i'm screwing up my months wasn't it was it the was it the 28th yeah. of february or no, 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 it was the end of March. It was sometime at the oh, end yeah, of March. It was, it was the, yeah, there. so it was the 28th of March. It was just, yeah. you were supposed to be here a couple of weeks ago and uh, touring a number of communities uh, around Minnesota. Yeah. And um, so, I mean, thanks for doing this online, Farah, because this sure. is a way of getting people prepared for your next month's uh, online conference and, and uh, getting them excited about attending that. That'll be good. Of course, of course. But I just want to say something. Phil's book is not on my website. I'm working on getting it on the website. Again, we need money to be able to buy it wholesale. Mm -hmm. uh, but that book is, I have a shelf in my house. I mean, I have an entire library. It's really a problem. But it's, <laughs> uh, it's a problem for other people. No. Yeah. My book. <laughs> I have a shelf that I call my reference shelf, my ref shelf. Mm -hmm. And these are books that I need to get to right away. I can't look for them. I need to find them. That book is on my shelf and it is striped with yellow. Um, <laughs> yeah, and it's striped with yellow. I actually have somebody, I, I've been telling people to purchase it and read it. I have somebody who said she ordered it from Amazon several weeks ago and they keep telling her it's gonna get shipped, it's gonna get shipped and it never, it, is, it has, still has not arrived to her. Um, but this book, it's just incredible. Did Phil make an inscription? Here's the one he he made for me. Having done all, stand. Yes. So preparation, right? Preparation. Yes. And, uh, and then deploy the plan. Yep. He did write for me in my book. It's pretty awesome. I was pretty yep. starstruck. Even though I'd been touring with him, I'm like, oh, thank you. Yeah, starstruck is a, is a thing. Yeah. It's funny. It was like trying to get folks to, uh, you know, because he was treated like a rock star and he was a very humble and modest guy. He would roll into town and, and make friends wherever he went, and win people over. And people just couldn't believe he was actually here in person because, you know, this is a guy who has been on on Fox News, you know, and he's got a lot of press credentials and he's written a lot of articles for uh uh, is it understanding the threat or is it uh, Center for 
uh, sorry, uh, Center for Security Policy, I believe, yes, right? Yes. So um, he's someone who's kind of notorious in the, uh, what, what's it called, the, the business of, uh, you know, informing Americans and, and informing, uh, creating Minutemen wherever they go. It's like your program to, your mission to arm the shepherd, right? So that you want to empower the shepherd to be um, a good, uh, that is, that, that's ironic because the first time he was scheduled to speak in Rochester, it was at a church. And the church was pressured by uh, another church uh, to cancel the venue. So he was meant to speak at a Christian church and someone else in the same denomination at another location found out about it, called the church and pressured them to cancel. So from the very beginning, you see the, the power, the, the fear that they have that this man might come to town because they know how powerful he is and how insightful he is, that they actually have to stop him from speaking in yes. Rochester, actually. Yeah. So uh, is, there, is there anything positive, uh, anything else you want to say? Because I tend to go negative, sorry. That's okay. <laughs> I, well, I, have, I have so much positive. I yeah. really, I can't tell you how much I was looking forward to the tour with Phil. I was looking forward to that dreaded driving that I dread so much. Um, I was looking forward to it. I was like, how blessed am I? I'm going to be stuck in the same car with Phil for <laughs> endless hours for days. And <laughs> everything. I mean, yeah. one of the things that I want to say before I forget, because you touched on it, he made everybody feel like they were best friends. I felt um, Phil talked me through a lot of stuff and, and walked me through a lot and challenged me on my faith and challenged me on my life. Um, some really super personal things. And, um, uh, I felt like he felt like a father figure to me and I felt like I've known him my whole life. Like it just clicked. And what I didn't realize until he actually passed was that he made everybody feel that way. He just, he just did. He met you. You felt like you were his best friend. Um, and he was honest and genuine and an open book um, and just kind of really loved on everybody. And that was amazing. That's that's incredible to me because I am naturally introverted. A lot of people don't believe that because I get on stage and I talk. But <laughs> off of the stage, I'm really quiet. I'm like, please don't see me. Don't look at me. <laughs> don't look um, and, and I don't pick up the phone and talk to people. <laughs> I don't do that. I'm not a people person. And Phil was the epitome of what a people person was. He remembered things about your life. You wouldn't think that he knows thousands of people because yeah. he remembered you individually, personally, what the struggles you're going through are, what your achievements are. Um, he delighted in my children. He, um, he also loved flowers. He had a thing for flowers. He would mm. randomly, like, I'd randomly get a text from Phil. It's like a picture. So he's like, look at our California flowers. I'm like, <laughs> my heart, thank you. I love that. Um, so he had a way of, of cheering you up, of, of making you feel like you're family, like you're his best friend. And even though, like you said, he wined and dined with celebrities and knew them personally, he was very humble super down to earth would get on the phone with me for like a couple of hours after a couple of hours he's like so are you are you done talking yet are you tired of talking to me yet i'm like honestly no <laughs> 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 to go because i have to take care of my children <laughs> i have to take care of something else but it is killing me that i have to get off of this phone call so he's um he was just mm -hmm. i was I am very blessed to have ever known him um, and to have been loved by him. It's really, truly incredible. That's, that's beautiful. And that's a wonderful uh, testimony to Phil Haney's life. It's a beautiful celebration of life and they are tears of joy. Yes. <laughs> tears of joy. Yes. For having, uh, had him walk with us for a while, that, that gaunt figure, almost a Don Quixote, 
type of figure and uh we'll we, we miss him yeah. and um so let's just say one more time Farah prudence uh free the captive is her ministry and you can find it at freethecaptive.org or you can reach her at Farah, F-A-R-R-A-H, at freethecaptive.org. And Farah, thank you so much for sharing in this Celebration of Life event for Philip Haney. Thank you. Thank you, Wes. Thank you for having me. And thank you for this opportunity for us to bring the truth out to people because the newspapers and the media did not, did not do a good job talking about Phil. And people need to know the truth. So thank you for heading this up. That's incredible. Well, it's it's just what we have to do. They they smacked a dish full of water and the water has splashed all over the place. And so everyone's just doing more now. Everyone's stepping up. Exactly. And uh, so thank you, Farah. We'll see you next month on tour as well. <laughs> Absolutely.